the Lord blessed me with some spare, spare time. So I'm researching hungrily and studying more is not on the end times or prophecy or what's going on around our world. And I want our onliners to understand that. What are you spending your time on? See, I don't want you to keep watching endless videos on YouTube when it should be something more important in your life. You got to avoid that. There is a, something where we should be aware of what's going around in our world, that we shouldn't be ignorant. But you full know well that you are prioritizing that more than your spiritual growth with God. So if you're prioritizing your spiritual growth with God, then you would be studying more on those things than end time stuff. Amen. So uh, your pastor, what he wants to study more is on, obviously, prayer. Amen. So tonight I'm going to give you two good lessons on just prayer. So I think you'll enjoy it. John chapter 15, verse 7. If I hear an awe over there, you know, oh, I wanted to hear end times, and you're in the wrong church. Amen. All right? All right, that's not what your pastor is known for, okay? He is known for that because he's the, uh, one of the few Bible believers who really talk about that. That's the only reason why I get really big on that one. But that's not what I should be known for as. Amen. It should be more on, your, uh, on the Bible. It should be simply just on the Word of God. Okay, so John chapter 15, and then we'll read verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. So if, you, if Jesus Christ keeps abiding in you and his words keeps abiding in you, look at this. This is important. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now the greatest problem with the Christian church nowadays is that they lack the power of prayer. And when we are praying, we're not seeing as many answers like we wanted. And sometimes we wonder, what is wrong? Why is it that the Lord is not answering my prayer life? It's because you're praying wrong. That's the answer. You're praying wrong. But notice over here, that's not what God intended. God did not intend where he does not answer prayer. What did he intend on? He intends on answering prayer consistently. That's what he wants. He is that type of God. But why is it that the church has become so weak that God has not been answering prayer? So obviously, it's not something where God does not want to answer your prayer. It's the church's fault. The church is the problem where they are lacking in their prayer life. That's the issue over here. So then, uh, what is it? Notice over here, if you ask what he will, read that passage. You ask what he will, then what? It's going to be done unto you, right? Well, it's not working. Well, why is it not working? Did you read the condition? Did you read the condition? Christ abides in you. My word abide in you. Ah, so then here's the thing. God Almighty, who is up in heaven, there's one of the greatest things that he can ever do in your entire life, and that's the king of glory who fills up heaven and earth and all of creation, that God Almighty himself would choose to come down on this corrupted, sinful body of yours and choose to live in there. And that's something, right? So he would choose to live in there. Now, Christ is remaining in you, right? Amen. But the thing is, is that you don't really treat it that way. You know what you yield more often? I'll tell you what you yield more often. What you yield more often is on this particular guy, and that's flesh rather than the other side, which you should be focusing more, which is the spirit. So when you live your daily life, it is very easy to take naturally, as a matter of fact, as soon as you wake up in the morning, of your flesh. That's the first thing you think about. I mean, what, you brush your teeth as soon as you wake up, right? You uh, go out and run around and exercise taking care of your physical body, right? The first thing in your mind is flesh when you wake up in the morning and eat breakfast. So I'm sorry, it is not God that you wake up uh, when you think about first thing in the morning. It is flesh. Amen. So you got to understand that the flesh is considered dead to us. It is crucified. Why? Because of the crucified life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of our crucified life in Christ, it should be where this old man, the flesh, should be considered dead. And that's found in Romans chapter 6, which I won't cover, but we know that. 
Your pastor taught you this before. When I say your pastor, obviously I'm talking to my church, so onlineers don't get upset about that. But anyways, so the flesh should be dead to us because of the crucified life in Christ. Then that means if because of Christ, right, because of the crucified life in Christ, the flesh is dead, then what should our focus be in? It should be on Christ. It should be on Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, He is inside us, and that is Christ formed in you, the hope of glory, actually. Because the Holy Spirit comes in the stead of Christ. So is Christ remaining in you? Yeah, because He's sealed unto the day of redemption, you might say. That's not what I'm asking you. We know that, all right? But are you uh, in your standing, see that? So when you're looking at where you're standing, are you really remaining in Christ? Christ remains in you, I know that for a fact, but you're not remaining in Christ. You're not focusing, you're not remembering, you're not seeing that Christ is remaining in you. Instead, you're seeing your flesh remaining in you. So simply, what I'm, uh, inst uh, some of you might get lost and you might say, Pastor, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, let me just make it plain. Basically, Christ is not the first thing out of, in your mind. Christ is not the first thought that you think about, the first emotion that you feel when you wake up in the morning. Christ is not constantly in your mind when you do uh, normal duties throughout the day. Christ is, uh, what Christ would want you to do is not where your heart is lying in. It's where your flesh wants you to do. So that's the basic point that I'm getting at, is that f you're letting flesh remain in you rather than Christ. So if Christ remained in you, think about it. If Christ is the center of all your being throughout your life, then do you think that if this is Christ that you're living in, and then when you're giving the prayer, which is the prayer of Christ, do you think that God would more likely answer that then? Yes. That's where answer comes in. Why is he not answering? Because it's more revolved around your flesh rather than, the, rather than the spirit, which is Christ, formed in you. Right? And how do you know what Christ wants for you in your life? Is that, notice it says, continuing on, and my words abide in you. Did you read that over there? So that's why one of the valuable weapons where God answers prayer, which some people don't know about and then others do. George Mueller would always do this, is that he would point out to a verse in the Bible and then point out to the Lord, this is what you promised, Lord. Yeah. So because of that, you have to answer it, and then God would answer it. Why does that become the case? Because Christ's words abide in you. So then, if Christ is the center of your life, obviously His words would obviously be the center of your life. And then when you t pray to the Lord what you want to be answered, it would obviously be His words. In order to get, power uh, in order to get powerful prayers answered, the point is this. The point is, is that it's got to be something what God wants, what God would think. But then, how would you know what God wants, what God would think, if Christ remained in you? If Christ is all your thought, if his words are all your thought, then you know how God would want it to be answered. Now, uh, here's an uh, easy example. How do you get a father, and God is your father, how would you get him uh, to answer your prayers quite often because you're his child? Now, how would a child convince his father? Not by, being, not by giving a request that the child knows the father would not answer that the father would be uncomfortable with. To get the father to answer the child's request, you go by the father's thinking. You know what he say no to and what to convince him in. Or you know what he would say yes in, so it would be easy for you to ask him. And it would be done in faith. A lot of people, when they pray to the Lord, they say, Lord, uh, when I pray to you, I want this to happen, but I don't know what your will is for me on that one. So, uh, to be honest, uh, do what you want rather than what I want. So a lot of times we pray about that, but actually there's a problem with that that you didn't realize. The problem is, is that you're not in sync with the Father, see? Because you acknowledge that your will is going to be different from His will. 
Why shouldn't the child know what his father's will is? Shouldn't you know? I don't really know, Pastor. That's right, because you're so weak spiritually. But you know what your flesh knows, what your flesh wants. But you don't know what your spirit wants, huh? So that's the reason why uh, when these prayer warriors, when they prayed in faith, they said, Lord, I want so-and-so to get saved, or I want this money need met. And they believed it would happen. But shouldn't we surrender it to the Lord's will? Maybe it's not his will for that one. But these people did, Mueller and these people. They knew he would answer. How do they know that? Because they're that much sync with the Father. Uh, some of the, uh, here's one statement that you never realize. Is that, doesn't God want you to be happy? Isn't that an easy question? Yes or no, right? God wants you to be happy. What makes you happy? Wouldn't that make God happy? That's something you should ask yourself. What would make God happy? Does that make you happy? See, so you know what things would not make God happy. And you know some things that won't make you happy if you live according to sin in the flesh. Basically, any desire that you should have in your life, God would want that for you. But if you know which desires would go in conflict with God, then obviously you know that would not make God happy and also it will not make you happy. So know this is that happiness is not just applied to what, God, what makes God happy, what makes God happy. No, it's you. Why? Because it should be in sync with God. Now, ask yourself this question, what makes you happy? And go through all that list. And when you go through all that list, what makes you happy? Do you think that would make God happy? Do you think that's in sync with God as well? Or do you think 90% of it is going to go in conflict with God? What makes a truly happy person is that they are truly in sync with God. And when they are in sync with God, you'll realize that, look, it's not like what makes God happy, what makes God happy. That's like the wrong focus over here. The focus should be what makes me happy. And what makes me happy should be in sync with God. That's true happiness. Imagine having a joy that whatever you wanted, the Lord will give it to you. Wouldn't you like that in your life? Yeah, anyone would want that in your life. But see, the problem is, is that we, when we say what makes me happy, we separate God. See, that's the problem. But when you go in sync with God, what makes me happy? A lot of people think what makes God happy, what makes God happy, and then they're not happy. See? You got to think about what makes me happy, and is that in sync with God? And when you do that, see, then through this father-child relationship, you know that what makes you happy will make the father happy. So then, let's say, for example, the child and the father, uh, the child knows that the father loves sports, loves playing baseball, and, if, and they always watch baseball games together. So then if the child brings up, hey, you, uh, let's watch the finals going on in baseball, he knows that the father would grant the request and would want to join him. And they're both happy together. But if the father has a different happiness from the child in that baseball game, then he knows that it's not going to sink. And both aren't going to be happy, neither would the child. So see, that's how we get prayer answered, is that what makes you happy would make God happy. That's natural. We always think this, what makes God happy, what makes God happy. And then that's why you get all miserable and depressed. It's got to be what makes me happy, what makes me happy, that's in line with God. But see, the selfish world is this. What makes me happy? What makes me happy? And then ignorant Christians who want to please God but don't know much, they keep thinking what makes God happy? What makes God happy? No, you and God should be together because Christ remains in you. That's good. And then that's why prayer can be answered in a powerful way. But your prayer life is weak and it's not been effective. You can't believe what you pray is going to be answered because you're not in sync with Christ. Now, you don't want to tempt the Lord. I, I'm, I don't want to encourage people to go off and cavalier and pray, Lord, uh, I want to pray that I believe that you're going to answer. Uh, I believe you're going to answer this. So I know it's in sync. It's what you want. So you're going to let it happen. And it doesn't happen. Why? Because you haven't spiritually matured yet. That's why it's so important. You got to spiritually grow and not get into this. You wasted too much time on this. Amen. You need to start growing in this. And trust me. When you, what starts out with uncertainty in prayer, seeking God's will, 
When you seek God's will, you're going to eventually find God's will. And then you're going to know God's will. And then you're going to get used to seeing how God does things according to his will. And you got so much experience in it that you know what to pray for that's going to be according to his will. Was that too deep for you? Or did some of you catch that? If some of you did not catch that, then you have not grown yet, see? So that's why it's so important to grow and walk with God. So you can know what he answers will be your answer. Now... There is one thing that I want to say that's eye-opening. Go to the book of Matthew. Look at chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26. Now, there's one thing I want to say. Just because, uh, in, in this father and child relationship, it's natural that the child, when he requests of the father, because the father loves the child, he'll grant him the request, and and the child will know the father will answer if what? He understands his will, right? That's the key. He, know, he understands his will because it's based on the spirit. There's one thing I want to say carefully. So this helped me a lot because I know that there are fleshly requests that I have that the Lord granted because he's merciful and gracious. He does that. So then I'm like kind of wondering, so then should I take in confidence that when I give a fleshly request to the Lord, listen up now, when I give a fleshly request to the Lord, can I be like George Mueller, 100% confident that the Lord will answer that? I want to say this, no, you cannot. If you want to have the 100% confidence like George Mueller had that God will answer this prayer, it all has to be about the spirit. But if it's something fleshly, and uh, if it's something fleshly, then it's going to be uncertain, right? Is it okay to pray for that and seek God's will where you're uncertain? Absolutely. You know why? Because look at what Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed according to the Father's will. But when he prayed according to this Father's will, he knows that what he wants may not be what the Father wants. So look at Matthew chapter 26. And then we'll read verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, look at this, what? If it be possible. See that? He couldn't say 100%, Lord, I know you're going to take this cup away from me. No, he didn't do that. Because he knows that what Scripture prophesied, right, about his death. So that's why he's trying something where, he, uh, where his human flesh wants. I mean, obviously, anyone would who'd want to go through the crucifixion right if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless what not as I will but what as thou wilt did you know about the prayer of Jacob in the book of Genesis Lord if you bless me with this 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 and you will be my God is that a spiritual prayer or a flesh fleshly prayer that's a fleshly prayer and a lot of charismatics want to go for the fleshly prayers Jabez, the prayer of Jabez is what health and wealth, prosperity, gospel preachers abuse, saying, God will answer that prayer 100%. Because what Jabez said, Lord, bless me with a big uh, household and life, and I'll worship you and all that. And God answered it. But that's a fleshly prayer. David, he wanted, uh, uh, he wanted multiple wives, and God said at the book of Samuel that if you asked for more, I would have given it to you. That's what he said. You think that's spiritual or that's fleshly? That's fleshly. So see, because this is natural in the father-child relationship. Sometimes, the ch what would the child do? The child knows that there, knows there are requests. Knows there are requests that are purely from his fleshly motive that the father may not answer, may or may not answer. So that's why, will the child uh, hold himself back and not ask the father? No, he'll ask anyway. He'll ask anyway. So that's why there are times that fleshly requests, there's nothing wrong with asking a fleshly request. You see that all over the Bible. But it is wrong when this is what? When this is more than what? This person. Then we know you got a problem. This is a good picture. So there is a balance. See, that, look, people think it's a sin to pray fleshly requests. No, it's not. You'd be surprised how good God is. But then again, you got these charismatics running around giving so many fleshly requests that the book of James chapter 4 says, you ask, but you don't get it because you consume it upon your lust. See, that's the point. The point is when the flesh is consumed, that's a problem. 
Let me tell you, I give him fleshly requests, requests that would make you think, man, pastor, you're just so fleshly. But the Lord, you'd be amazed how gracious he was in my life and granted them to me. And there are prayer requests that when I prayed for, I know the Lord will answer. And I believed it. Why? Because I know what he wants. So that's how prayer life revolves around. That's how you know what's faith and what's not faith. When it's God's will and when it's not God's will. So this is important in your life so that this is how you can tell. How can I tell if my prayers are answered, right? You want that kind of feeling? Now you know. Now you know. Now you know what, how he answers prayers. And you can put faith on it. And you can come boldly, boldly before the throne of grace. Was that fun? Yeah.